Well, like I just said a second ago, we're continuing on in a series of messages today that we kicked off two weeks ago that we're calling Trapped. And in this series, we're talking about how to break free from sin and temptation in our lives. And this is what we said in week one of this series, just kind of catch you up where we've been the last two weeks. We said this, that sin traps us, but it's Jesus that sets us free. Amen, somebody? And in week one, we talked about how to break the cycle of sin in our lives. And then last week, we said this, that what you're trying to hide, God is actually seeking to heal. And we talked about the power of prayer and the power of confession. And so if you missed either one of these messages, I want to encourage you, you can always go catch up at keyschurch.com or if you're a podcast, any podcast people in here, right? You can always check out the Keys Church audio podcast wherever you listen to podcast at. But today, we are going to be continuing on in this series. And I want to teach to you a message this morning that I'm simply calling Run Away. And as I said just a few moments ago, I want to encourage you to take notes this morning. Take notes on the back of that worship guide. Type them up on your phone. Take pictures of the slides up here on the screen. And before we get started this morning, a quick disclaimer. I said this two weeks ago. I said it last week. We sent out an email yesterday. Today's service is PG-13, for lack of a better term, <laughs> because of the content that we're going to be talking about because today we're going to be talking about sexual sin and sexual immorality. And we're going to be talking about it very frankly, kind of bluntly, candidly, not graphically though, but we're just going to talk about it in the way that scripture talks about it. And so one of the ways that we in our culture end up talking about sexual sin or sexual immorality is this word right here. It's the word lust. Right? And people talk about struggling with lust and lust being an issue for them. And this is extremely prevalent in Christian circles because, well, Scripture talks about lust. And as a matter of fact, Jesus himself even talks about lust when in Mark chapter 5, he raises the bar for me and you on what sexual sin and sexual immorality actually looks like. Because when talking to a group of people, he tells them, well, you, you've heard it said that you shouldn't commit adultery. And everybody's like, check, yes, don't commit adultery. Don't sleep with someone else's spouse. If you're married, don't sleep with someone who isn't your spouse. And really, the greater context of what the people hearing this would have known is that any sexual relations outside of how God has designed it, which is within the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman, is sexual sin. And Jesus says, hey, you've heard it said not to commit adultery. He said, but I'm doing you one better. I say, if you've even looked at a woman with lust, then you've committed adultery in your heart. Ouch. <laughs> so we're raising the bar. And the implication for me and you is, is that if we were to even look at someone else, another person with lust, that then we've committed sexual sin in our heart. We've committed sexual immorality. We have lusted. And just so we're all on the same page, here's the definition of, of the word lust. It's intense sexual desire or appetite. Or another definition is uncontrolled or illicit sexual desire or appetite. And I think that, that second one kind of really encapsulates it, right? That it's uncontrolled, that it's illicit. In other words, it's unlawful. That you actually know that it's wrong, but you, but you can't help it, right? You just struggle with lust. And here's what I know. Many, 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 many people struggle with lust. And lust is a trap. Make no mistake about it. And the unfortunate part, though, is, is that lust is the trap that no one likes talking about. <laughs> Like, we don't even like talking about it in church. Like, if I'm just being honest with you, like, this is not, like, my favorite subject matter to cover, right? Like, great. Like, I wasn't, like, super jazzed this week to write this sermon. You know, like, this was heavy all week long. Like, how do we talk about this with grace and truth, which is what we're called to do, right? So how do we, how do, we do that? But this is the truth about lust. It's the trap that no one likes to talk about because people are embarrassed by it, because it feels so personal, because it is personal. But here's the thing. I was texting with a friend in the church last night, and we were talking about this subject. And I just said, hey, if we don't talk about it, the world's going to, and the world will inform us on what to believe. And that's not how this works. <laughs> we have to see what Scripture says about these things. And here's what we need to know, that even though lust is a trap, and it's the trap that no one likes to talk about, the other truth is, is that lust is a universal problem. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Everyone struggles with lust. 
And if not everyone, then almost everyone, okay? You, at some point in your life, have struggled with lust. You have had a lustful thought. Maybe it was when you were younger. Maybe it was when you were a teenager. Maybe it was back when you were dating all the time. Maybe for some of you, it's still a struggle to this day. But it is a universal problem. This is like a one-size-fits-all. And it's why the Apostle Paul talks about it a ton in Scripture, specifically him. It's why Jesus addressed it in Scripture. Because this is just part of the condition of the human heart, that we're craving after something that we're not supposed to have. That's wrong. That's unlawful. That's not what God designed us to have. That's not how God designed us to operate. And here's what you and I need to know today. For us in our culture... That in our culture, lust is perpetuated by pornography. Another uncomfortable thing that no one likes to talk about, right? Like, especially in church, like, ugh, like the P word. Like that, we don't like that, right? But, it, but it's true. In our culture, the gas that fuels lust is pornography. That fuels sexual sin that fuels sexual immorality and just so we're all on the same page as to what i mean when i say sexual immorality this is what scripture teaches this is what we believe as a church that sex is only supposed to be between a man born a man and a woman born a woman within the covenant relationship of marriage period so anything outside of that is sexual sin and sexual immorality. So we're not picking on anybody this morning because it's not like only homosexuals practice sexual immorality. Nope, are you having sex before you're married? You're practicing sexual immorality. Are you having extramarital affairs? Sexual immorality. Are you looking at pornography? Sexual immorality. And in our culture, lust and this desire, it is perpetuated. It is fueled by pornography. It is the gas on the fire. And it's an issue. And the temptation is to bury our heads in the sand. And to act as if it's not a big deal. And so then we don't talk about it. And we don't talk about it in church. But I read one article this week that said, The pornography epidemic is not coming. It is already here. And it has already ruined an entire generation. And it's on its way to ruining another and another and another. And so in an effort to get us all on the same page to just it, how serious of an issue this is, I just want to share with you some quick pornography statistics, which is probably not what you thought you were going to see when you came to church this morning, okay? Like, but it's important for us to know the things that we're about to talk about, to know that these things are studied and documented and true, and if we're honest, probably very underreported. Because everything that I'm about to show you is just what people have admitted to. And so all these statistics I'm about to share with you come from five or six articles this week. I narrowed it down to ten things to share with you because I literally had probably about 75. And I narrowed it down to ten things that I wanted to share with you. And these articles range from 2016 to this year of people taking this data. And I'm just going to throw them all up here and then we're going to talk about them kind of individually. And so if you want to take a picture, you can take a picture. Some of these are going to shock you. Some of these are not going to shock you. But 12% of all websites contain pornography. 12%. More than one in every 10 websites contain pornography. I don't know about you, but it seems like a lot to me. Like the internet's a big place. 12%. One in three Americans here in our culture, in our context, one in three Americans seek out pornography monthly. These are people who admit to it. One in three, 33% of Americans seek out to look and view pornography monthly. Roughly 13% of all people of the entire world, of the global population, are addicted to porn. Not everybody has access to porn. And yet 13% roughly, because that's, again, this one was like a rough guesstimation. that They were trying to gather all of these statistics to figure this out. 13%, more than one in every 10 people. Addicted, not looks, not struggles, like full-blown addiction to pornography. 68% of church-going men view porn regularly. Again, these are men who have just admitted this. 
Which doesn't include the ones who are so ashamed that they're not even going to give it anonymously on a survey. Like, I'm not going to say that I do that. I'm not, I can't even admit to myself that I do this. 87% of Christian women have admitted to watching porn. So we see this is not just a male problem. This is also a female problem. This is a universal problem. This is a human problem. A sin problem. Something that we all struggle with. And so we maybe would think, well, maybe it's better, you know, because people are just struggling because there's a bunch of single people in the world. Right? So no wonder they're struggling. Nope, 55% of married men admit to watching porn once a month. That means that statistically, I'm not saying this is true, this is just statistically, that statistically... Half of the married men in our church view pornography. 25% of married women watch porn once a month or admit to it. Again, just statistically speaking, this would mean that one in four married women in our church view pornography at least once a month. 56% of all divorces involve one party having obsessive interest in porn. Another study that I didn't put on here said that they actually correlate 68% of divorces have to do with using the internet, pornography, and seeking out other sexual partners. 68%. But 56%, it's cited as the reason for divorce. Obsessive interest. Addiction. And then the last two are the ones that really hit home for me as a father of four. And if you have kids, probably hit home for you too that 11 is the average age a child is first exposed to pornography. I have an 11-year-old daughter. That hurts. And 94% of children will see porn by the time they're 14. They will be exposed. This is a problem. This is an issue. This is an epidemic. And it is here. And the temptation is to bury our head in the sand and go, not my kid. They're good. Not my family, not my brother, not my sister, not my spouse. Not like we're good. And yet, statistically, it's just not the case. Maybe you're in that little percentile, hopefully, praying to God that that's the case. That's what we want for everybody. But for the majority of people, this is an issue. And not only are the statistics on pornography alarming, but so are the effects of pornography. Because in these same articles, I found these different things that were studies and polls that were done that talked about the effects, the actual effects on people who view pornography on a regular basis, that it would be habitual for them to view pornography. The first thing that we need to know is this, that there is a dopamine release similar to hard drugs when somebody views pornography. So dopamine is this chemical that releases in your brain that gives you this euphoric feeling. And it's what people get when they scroll social media and it's what some people get when they click that buy button on Amazon. It's a chemical that is released when people do hard drugs like cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine. And there are similar releases when people view pornography to when people do hard drugs. So maybe now we can understand why it's such an issue. Why it's so addictive. Why it has people trapped and has its claws in people. Because it's chemical. In the brain. Because they're literally getting a high off of it and they're chasing that next high even if they don't want to. Even if that's not who they want to be. Even if they don't want to look at that stuff anymore. They're struggling. They're trapped. They're in chains. They're in bondage. Second thing is this. The people who view pornography habitually report higher rates of depression and anxiety. It actually makes their life worse and not better. That there are higher rates of depression and anxiety for them. That this thing that maybe they run to when they're stressed, this thing that they run to when they're anxious, this thing that they run to as a coping mechanism is actually the very thing that's keeping them in chains. And it's actually the very thing that's keeping them depressed and anxious. There's also lower levels of relational satisfaction for people who view pornography on a regular basis. I'm sure because they're comparing their relationship because they can't be happy Because they're always looking at something or someone different. And it creates this longing. And so they're just unsatisfied in their relationships. And then another thing is 
that it gives unrealistic sexual expectations that people then bring into their bedrooms with their partners, with their spouses. I used to tell teenagers this all the time when I was in student ministry. I would say, especially in the small groups of young men that I would mentor, I would say, don't you realize you're watching actresses? Like this is not real life. This is fantasy. These people are getting paid for this. This is not real. You are not going to step into a relationship and it looked this way and yet this is what happens for people. They view this stuff online and they view these people living out these fantasies because this is what it is and they think, well, this is just real life. And they bring these expectations into their relationship and that's why it says that people who view pornography regularly actually have lower levels of sexual satisfaction. The very thing that they run to for satisfaction and gratification is the thing that is the barrier to them actually experiencing the fullness of what God intends for them in sex. There's lower levels. Because, well, it's not as good as I thought it was going to be because, well, she doesn't look like her and he doesn't look like him and that's not what I thought this was going to be and that's not what I saw in the movies. And when's the last time we thought the movies were real? Lower levels of sexual satisfaction. And the last one, this, that there are studies that show that there is a reduction of gray matter in the brain for people who watch porn habitually. In other words, it physically affects your brain. It physically alters your brain and the chemistry of your brain and there's a reduction in gray matter. And it's like, okay, what, is, what does that mean? Gray matter is what helps you with decision making and impulse control. And there's a reduction for people who view porn on a regular basis. This is an issue. This is a problem. We see the statistics. We see the effects. And we see just what a trap sexual sin is. Just what a trap sexual immorality is. Just what a trap lust is. And here's what we have to know. If lust is the trap, pornography is the bait. <laughs> This is the truth in our culture. That pornography is what's luring people in. And it's trapping them. And it's putting them in chains. And they're in bondage and they don't feel like they can get free. Because, well, it's at their fingertips all the time. Because they don't have to go to a drug dealer to get it. All they have to do is click on a link. Lust is the trap. Pornography is the bait. And so the question, what do we do? Right? Because you may be thinking, Pastor, you've made this seem really hopeless, man. Like, this is, this is not good. Like, man, I thought I was going to go to church and get a life-giving message today. I think I'm going to go to a different church next week. <laughs> what do we do? Luckily, Scripture gives us answers on what to do. Scripture gives us answers on how to fight sexual sin, sexual immorality, and lust. And so I want to look at that today. And so this morning, we're going to be in Scripture. We're going to be in the New Testament, which is the last third or so of your Bible. We're going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there. If not, don't worry. It's going to be up here on the screen. We call it the book of 1 Corinthians. It's actually a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And he had helped plant this church. And he writes this letter to the Corinthians because there's a lot of stuff going on in their church. It's just like not good. And the reason that there's a lot of not good stuff going on in their church is because Corinth in their time was like our modern day Las Vegas, but worse. They're about 45, 50 miles outside of Greece or outside of Athens, Greece. And so they had all of these things that they were known for in Corinth. None of them being good. Things like drunkenness and sexual immorality and debauchery of all kinds. And here's the thing. All of it was accepted. All of it was legal. And all of it was encouraged. As a matter of fact, in Corinth, there was a temple to the Greek goddess Aphrodite. The goddess of fertility. And there were temple priestesses, or really, they were just temple prostitutes. And every night, these temple prostitutes would leave the temple, would go out into the city, and would seek out men in the city to sleep with as an act of worship. And the men were encouraged to just do it. Because, well, that was just part of the culture. 
And that was just part of who they were. And it was this type of stuff that was now going on within the church and Paul's having to be like, ah, no, no, no. Like, that's not who we are anymore. That's not, who we, that's not how we operate anymore. And so Paul writes to the Corinthians about sexual immorality, about sexual sin, about lust, and about how to deal with it. And I believe that we can learn from what he tells them about how we can deal with it in our life, in our context, and in our culture. And so picking up in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, this is what it says. It's Apostle Paul talking here. He says, I have the right to do anything, you say. But not everything is beneficial. So apparently this was a saying within the church in Corinth. Or the people of Corinth. This idea that I have the right to do anything. We're not 100% sure why this was a saying. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that when Paul planted that church. He no doubt told them about their Christian liberty. And that Gentiles didn't have to be circumcised. And they didn't have to follow Jewish customs. And that they were actually free in Christ. Which is true. Right? Right? Or maybe it had to do with the fact that just about everything was legal in Corinth. And so there was nothing illegal to do outside of like maybe murder, depending on, you know, the circumstances. So like, I'm actually free to do anything. I have the right to do anything. And Paul says, yeah, but not everything is beneficial. We know this, right? Like, I don't know about any of y'all and your story, but, like, I was a chubby kid, okay, when I was little. Like, I was a little, little chubby kid, okay? And, like, every kid's dream, and don't you act like this was not your dream. I wanted to eat cookie dough for every meal at one point in my life, okay? Like, every kid thinks this, like, one day when I'm an adult, I'm going to eat all the cookie dough. Because I get, like, one piece once a year at Christmas time, and, like, it's delicious, okay? And I can remember being this chubby little kid and being in the grocery store. My parents used to be like, one day, <laughs> you know, like, one day get to have all the cookie dough that I want. And here I am, a grown adult, and guess what I have the right to do? Eat as much cookie dough as I want. Praise God, right? Like, I can eat as much as I want. I can eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It could be the only thing that I ever ate. And why don't I? Because it's not beneficial. Because I know that it would actually be bad for me. Because I know that it would actually make me sick. Do I have the right to do it? Absolutely, I have the right to do it. But just because I have the right to do it, doesn't actually make it right. It's not actually beneficial. Paul repeats himself, I have the right to do anything. This is what you say. But I will not be mastered by anything. I'm not going to be a slave to anything. Paul says, you may have the right to do anything, but as for me, nothing is going to trap me. And what's Paul telling the Corinthians and what he's telling us is this, that freedom in Jesus is not freedom to sin. You need to know this. This is not why Jesus came and died on the cross. It wasn't so that we could live a debaucherous life and then get heaven one day. Like that was not the point. Our freedom in Jesus is not freedom to sin. It's actually the opposite. It's freedom from sin. That we don't have to be the people who we don't want to be anymore. That we don't have to be in slavery, that we don't have to be in bondage, that we don't actually have to live trapped, that we can be free in the name of Jesus. This is the truth for each and every one of us. Freedom in Jesus, it's not freedom to sin. He's just reminding them that, yeah, you got the freedom to do whatever, but it's not beneficial. Are the things that you're doing actually putting you in bondage? You're freed from sin, not freed... To sin, he continues, he says, You say, this is another saying that they had, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. This was a saying they had in Corinth. This was a little idiom, kind of like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? Like you've probably heard that. And we all know, like, that's not true. Like, what happens in Vegas leaves with you. Like, what are you talking about? Like, that's not how that works. Like, but this was a saying they had. The food is for stomach and the stomach is for food. Here was the implication. When I'm hungry, I eat. Right? When I'm tired, I sleep. And for the Corinthians, when I have some sexual desires, I just go fulfill them. With whoever, whenever, whatever. It doesn't matter. Because it's just the, the body. Because, well... The food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food. My body is just for me and my pleasure and my life and whatever. And after all, God's going to destroy them both because this body's just on loan until we get new ones, right? 
Like it's what they think. Like it doesn't matter what I do with this body, Paul, because you told us like that we're going to get new bodies. Just like when Jesus was, was raised from the dead. But Paul directly combats this line of thinking and he says, no, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality. Like you need to know this, just plain, right there, explicitly. Not going to make you try to fill in the blank here. Like the body's not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Your body is not your own. You are to be a good steward of your body because your body is the Lord's. The Lord's given it to you. Your body is for the Lord and the Lord for your body. He reminds them by his power God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. That Jesus' physical body was resurrected. This was not a metaphor. This was real. And so Paul's understanding was, so then, this means for you, one day you will die and that body will be raised again. Therefore, what you do with your body matters. And being a good steward of your body matters. And if we're going to be good stewards of our body, then there is no room for sexual immorality. He says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Like, do you not know? Did I not explain this well to you? Do you not fully understand? Have you forgotten? For some of you, is this the first time that you're hearing this, that your bodies are members of Christ himself? And so, shall I then take members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Emphatically. Like, like he's like, um, rhetorical question, but I feel like I need to answer it just in case you don't know the answer. Like, no. And again, this is his context, right? And this is what's going on with these prostitutes, these temple priestess, and then the men and the women in this community. And so how could we say this? Shall I then take my body, shall I take members of Christ, and shall I unite them with pornography? Shall I unite them with anybody that I meet on Tinder? Shall I unite them with, you know... This boyfriend because after all I did it with the last one. Or this girlfriend because I did it with the last one. Or this person because my spouse will never find out about it. The answer is no. The answer is never. Like this is not what we're supposed to do. He says do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body. For it is said this is what scripture says. The two will become one flesh. He's reminding them, sex meant for the covenant of marriage and the covenant of marriage only. Because anything outside of that actually ties you to someone else. It actually links you with someone else. It binds you together. What is Paul telling them? He's telling them this. Sex isn't just physical, it's spiritual. And some of you have experienced this in your own life. Why can't I get over this person that I dated five years ago? It's the first person you ever slept with. Why can't I, I move on? Why do I feel attached to every single person? It's because you're having sexual relations with them. Because sex is not just physical. This is what the Corinthians thought. Like I'm hungry, I eat. You know, I got some sexual desires. I'll just go fulfill them. It's just physical. No, it's not. It's actually spiritual. That's the way that God designed it. That there's something that happens that we don't fully understand, but we know that scripture says it. And for many of you, you've experienced it, that when you unite in that way sexually, the two become one. This is the way that God designed it. And there are real studies that show that the more sex you have, the harder it is to pair bond with somebody. The more partners you have, the harder it is to then remain faithful to your spouse, to feel connected to your spouse. Why? Because you were only ever supposed to be with one person. And it was supposed to be protected within the covenant of marriage. Because sex, it is not just physical, it is spiritual. Paul reminds them, he says, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. He's saying, don't forget... When you sleep with somebody, now you're, you're tied to them and you're not united with them in spirit in the same way that when you're united with the Lord, you're united with Him in spirit. Just doubling down on this idea. But then thankfully, Paul gives us some application. <laughs> 
He gives us a step to take. It's not just all doom and gloom. And it's not just all like, hey, you're doing the wrong thing. Like he actually begins to tell the Corinthians what to do to combat sexual sin, lust, and sexual immorality in their culture and in their lives. Flee from sexual immorality. That word flee means run away. Don't tiptoe around it. Don't see how long you can live with it. Don't see if I can just keep it in the dark and keep it quiet and no one's going to be any wiser because of it. No, like you need to flee sexual immorality. Leave it in the rear view mirror and then don't even look in the rear view mirror. Like it's got to go. We have to flee sexual immorality. He says all other sins a person commits are outside of the body. But whoever sins sexually will... They sin against their own body. And what on earth does he mean when he says that? What he's saying is sexual sin is actually a form of self-harm. Which may seem like strong language, but it's what he's saying. That sexual sin is us actually hurting ourselves. It's us harming ourselves. And here's what we need to know. Sexual immorality is a form of self-harm. And it affects you physically, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. And I don't even have to do like any convincing on this. Like I don't think anybody's going to be like, no, that's not true. Like everybody's like, mm, yeah. It affects you physically. How? Well, STDs, unplanned pregnancies, lead to abortion, lead to higher adoption rates and ch children in the foster system. And it doesn't even just affect you physically. It affects the other person physically. Then we just talked about how it affects you spiritually, that it, that it ties you to someone else, but we also know that it affects you mentally and emotionally. We just look at those statistics from pornography. That now you can't be satisfied in a relationship. Now you're constantly comparing your partner to somebody else, your spouse to somebody else, or you're so insecure because you know they've been with somebody else, and so now you're thinking, I don't add up to this ex because I've seen pictures of him or I've seen pictures of her, and they look better than I do. And so like... What am I supposed to do? And you're insecure and it affects you mentally and it affects you emotionally. This is the truth about sexual immorality. And then Paul kind of closes this thought. This is what he says. He says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You've probably heard this verse before. Probably familiar with it. And people love to take this verse and be like, I, I grew up in the South, right? So like this is what we always heard like when I was younger in youth groups. Like, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So don't smoke cigarettes and don't drink alcohol. <laughs> you know, like anybody else hear this type thing growing up, right? It's like because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So don't eat the third double cheeseburger because like you need to be taking care of yourself. You know, like the second one, we're borderline, but don't eat the third one, okay? Like, and here's the thing. We can extrapolate that from this and like, Yes, that goes hand in hand with being a good steward. And the, obviously that's wisdom, right? That we would treat our bodies and be good stewards of our bodies because it's temple of the Holy Spirit. But can I remind you that here Paul is talking about sexual immorality. This is the context in which he feels the need to tell them this verse. That your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That your body is not for your pleasure. That your body is not for you to chase after every desire that you have. This is not the point. This is not the purpose of your body. It's a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You are not in charge. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you no longer sit on the throne of your life. It should be Jesus who is the Lord of your life. He's not just your Savior. He's your Lord. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. What was that price? That while we were still sinners, God sent Jesus to die for me and you. To live a life we couldn't, a sinless life. To die a death that we deserve on the cross. To raise to life on the third day. To defeat sin, death, and the grave so that we could be called children of God. We have been bought at a price. Therefore, because that's true, because you know this, honor God with your bodies. Honor God. With your body. This is the command from Paul. This is not a suggestion. He's saying that our bodies are for worship. Our bodies house the Holy Spirit. 
We should be good stewards of our body. There's no room for sexual immorality in our body. We're not our own. We've been bought at a price. We have to honor God with our bodies. And here's what I believe, and I believe that if you're a Christian, you're going to agree with me on this, that if Jesus is the Lord of your life, then he should also be Lord of your body. Amen, anybody? Amen. Right? Like, I don't think I'm going to get any pushback from any Christians on this. Right? Like, we're all on the same page, that if Jesus is the Lord of our life, then that means that he should also be the Lord of our body. Okay, so now that we're all on the same page, let me challenge you with this. If Jesus isn't the Lord of your body, is he really the Lord of your life? Let that sit for a second. If he's not the Lord of your body, then is he really the Lord of your life or are you still calling the shots? And it doesn't mean that you're not saved. That's not what I'm saying. It doesn't mean that there's not grace for you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. But is it a struggle that you're being open and honest with? Are you trapped? Are you actively trying to get free? Or have you just decided that this is how I'm going to live and I'm fine with Jesus being my savior, but I'll continue to be the Lord. I'll continue to captain this ship because I think I'm doing a pretty good job, yet your world around you is crumbling. If Jesus is going to be the Lord of our life, then he also has to be the Lord of our body. And here's what I know. That there are people in this room, there are people watching online who this is your struggle. This is what has you trapped. This is what has you in chains. This is what has you in bondage. It is lust. It is sexual sin. It is sexual immorality. It is pornography. And here's what I want you to know this morning. That you can have freedom from sexual sin. Whatever the sexual sin is in your life. That let me remind you is anything outside of the marriage covenant that God has designed between one man and one woman. You can have freedom from it. Not that you might can. Not that you possibly could. But no, like, like you actually can. And yet some of you have convinced yourself like this is just my cross to bear. This is just the thorn in my flesh. This is just the thing that I'll struggle with until the day that I die. It's not true. It's a lie from the pit of hell. You can have freedom from sexual sin. And here's what I believe. If we want to be free, we have to flee. <laughs> this is what Paul says. If we want to be free, we don't play around with sin. We don't try to live with sin. We don't just try to keep it in the dark and keep it at bay. Like, no. If we want to be free, we have to flee. And I have some ideas on how it is that you and I can actually flee sexual sin. Just four quick things that you and I can do practically that will help us when it comes to sexual sin. The first one is this, that you need to admit that you have a problem. For some of you, you need to admit that to yourself first. That you don't have it under control. That it is an issue. That it is affecting your marriage or your relationships. You have to admit that you have a problem. And here's what I would encourage you to do. Is that once you've admitted that to yourself. You need to find somebody else who you can admit that to. Because can I tell you. You're going to need accountability. You're going to need somebody to lock arms with you. You're going to need somebody to check in on you. You're going to need somebody who you can say. Hey man I messed up this week. Not so they get all over you and say. See you're such a terrible person. And you're just going to be in chains forever. But so they can say. Alright what can we do to make sure what happened this week. Doesn't happen next week. You have to admit. That you have a problem. And then you need to identify. Stumbling blocks for you in your life. What are the things that are causing you to stumble. Is it your smartphone? Is it unfiltered access to the internet? Is it some other apps that you have on your phone? Is it social media? Is it going to the gym? I'm seeing the way people are dressed. Is it going to the public pool? Is it going to the beach? Like what is it for you that you know is a trigger that is a stumbling block for you? And here's the thing. Once we identify these stumbling blocks, then we have to put up safeguards. 
And you actually have to say, all right, I'm, I'm going to take a next step to eliminate this from my life. To put up some barriers, to put up some safeguards so that I can actually overcome this sin. And there's nothing about putting up safeguards that is you admitting defeat. It's you saying, I'm not going to be trapped by anything. I'm not going to be a slave to anything. I'm going to put up safeguards because I know who I want to be and this is going to help me get there. And so in your seat, every seat when you walked in today, Pastor Kirsten and I printed these out last night for you guys. There's this yellow card and it's got some resources on it. And the first four are different resources that you can use that block different things on the internet. Block access to things. You can use them for your children. You can use them for yourself. But they're really to help you filter out adult content because one in every 10 websites contain pornography, right? 12% is what we read. And so we know that this is an issue. There's Canopy, there's Covenant Eyes, which I've used personally. I would suggest that one. Bark, Plucky or Pluck Eye Filter, which is really, it, it's really good. I read up on that kind of extensively this week. And then the very last one is Key Groups. Get into a small group. Do life with some people. Get some accountability. Open up so that you can get free. So that you don't live trapped. I would encourage you to take these if you're struggling with any of what we've talked about today and that you would implement one of them prayerfully. Consider, do some research of your own. Consider how you're going to implement this in your life. You have to put up safeguards. And maybe for you, the safeguard is, I need to find a different gym to work out at because you don't care about this stuff, but like you lust after people every time you go to the gym. Well, maybe you need to invest in some equipment to work out at home. Or maybe you don't need to go to the pool in your neighborhood anymore because there's that person who you're attracted to that you see every time that you go to the pool and you know they're there, but you go anyway. Or maybe you stumble every time you go to the beach and so you just don't need to take beach trips anymore. And some of you are like, Pastor, like that seems outrageous. Never take beach trips anymore? How serious do you want to get free? Or do you just want to be in chains? Or do you just want to be trapped? We have to identify the stumbling blocks. We have to put up safeguards. And then we got to run the other way. Run away. Don't try to see how close you can get to the line. Don't see how close you can get to the edge without falling off. Don't see how close you can get to the fire without getting burned. That's not the point. That's not what we do with sexual sin. That's not what we do with any sin, but especially sexual sin, lust that sinks its claws deep into us. We have to run the other way. If we're going to flee sexual sin, we have to admit that we have a problem. We have to identify stumbling blocks. We have to put up safeguards. And then we have to run the other way. And here's the good news of the gospel. We can run away because Jesus made a way. Jesus made a way for you and I to be free. He made a way for you and I to step into a relationship with our Heavenly Father when He defeated sin, death, and the grave. Here's the thing. This is normally the part in the sermon in which I would wrap things up and be like, all right, so now we're going to pray and give people opportunity to accept Jesus, which we're going to do here in just a moment, right? But as I was writing the sermon this week and I got here, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, nah, this isn't where you stop this week. I said, okay. And I prayed about it and I, and I was thinking. I felt the Holy Spirit put this on my heart because here's what I know. That there are people in this room and there are people who are watching online who you are in chains. And you are riddled with shame over this very thing. And you've heard everything that I've said today. And in some ways it's like good reminders. In other ways it's kind of gone in one ear and out the other because you're like, Pastor, that sounds good. But you don't understand I've struggled with this since I was a teenager. I've struggled with this since high school. This is just who I am. If you knew the number of times that I've stopped and started and stopped and started and stopped and started and it's something that I think about every day and it's so difficult and I'm in chains and I'm just telling you like this is who I am. Can I remind you this morning that shame is from the enemy. Shame is never from God. And if you feel shame over your sexual sin... 
then that's from the enemy. But if you feel conviction, that's from the Lord. And that's the Lord wanting you to draw in to him. And this idea that you could never be free, that you're just going to be trapped, that this is just who you are, that this is somehow just your cross to bear, again, is a lie from the pit of hell. You need to know that. And here's what I felt the Holy Spirit tell me to share with you this morning. That your sin isn't too much for Jesus. Whatever it is that you're going through, whatever your struggle is, I know that this keeps people in bondage. It's not too much for Jesus. Just because it's the thing we keep quiet. Just because it's the thing that's seemingly more embarrassing than anything else. And it's the thing that we don't really want to talk about. And we don't do a good job of talking about. And we don't always articulate it the best when we're trying to talk about it in Christian circles and within the church. Doesn't mean that it's somehow unforgivable. It doesn't mean that the grace of God doesn't cover you. It doesn't mean that the blood of Jesus doesn't wash you white as snow. It does. Your sin is not too much for Jesus. And here's what I want you to know this morning. Each and every person in this room, each and every person walking on, watching online, no matter where you stand as far as it is when it comes to your relationship with God, this is what's true and what can be true for you, that in Jesus you are loved, you are forgiven, and you can be free. This is the truth. Do you call yourself a Christian? Are you in a relationship with Jesus? Guess what? You are loved. You are forgiven. And you can be free. And it may be a process. And it may get harder before it gets easier. And it may take months and it may take years. But you can be free in the name of Jesus. And maybe you're here and you've never stepped into a relationship with Jesus. Can I tell you this can be true for you because Jesus does love you. That is true. And when you call on his name, in that moment, you are forgiven. And you too can be free. And if you're here this morning and you're watching online and you want to step into that relationship and you want to experience that love and you want to experience that forgiveness and you want to be free, I want to give you the opportunity to do that this morning. Will you pray with me? Father God, Lord, you are good. Lord, right now I want to pray for anybody who's in this room, anybody who's within the sound of my voice right now, and they would say, hey, that's, that's me. I've been trapped. I've struggled with sexual sin, sexual immorality, lust, but I want to be free. And maybe, maybe they've never stepped into a relationship with you, but they know and they understand today that in Jesus they are loved and they can be forgiven and they can be set free to give them the opportunity to step into a relationship with you. Maybe they've walked away from a relationship with you and maybe you've just been the savior of their life but you haven't been the Lord of their life and they say hey, I want Jesus to set me free. I want to truly experience forgiveness. I want to truly experience freedom. I want to truly experience a relationship with Jesus and not just making him my savior but also making him my Lord. If that's you this morning, I want to give you an opportunity as well to step into a relationship with Jesus. To experience that love, to experience that forgiveness, to experience that freedom. Right where you are, you can just pray and repeat after me in your mind. No, it's not a prayer that saves you. It's the finished work of Jesus on the cross that saves you. But if you're ready to make that decision this morning, you can just pray something like this. Father God, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I accept your free gift of salvation. I believe Jesus lived the life I couldn't. That he died a death that I deserve on the cross, but he rose to life on the third day. That he defeated sin, death, and the grave. And because of him, one day, I'll get to be in heaven with you. Help me to follow you to the best of my ability for the remainder of my life. In Jesus' name. God, for the rest of us. Lord, I pray that you would help us run away from sexual sin. That you would help us flee sexual immorality. That you would help us actively fight lust, Lord. That we would admit that we have a problem. That we would understand what it is that's causing us to stumble. That we would set up things in our lives. Some safeguards that are going to protect us. That's going to help us to become who it is that you've created us to be. And that you would give us the strength to run away. To flee sexual sin and sexual immorality. God, I pray that people who need to take that next step. 
Maybe they're already in a relationship with you, but they need to take a next step. They need to get some accountability. They need to admit to somebody. They need to implement one of these safeguards in their life that you would give them the courage to do that and to take that next step this week. God, thank you for everybody who's here. Thank you for everybody who's within the sound of my voice. I pray that you would be with them this week, Lord, that you would protect them, that you would go before them and behind them and give them favor with you and everyone they see and talk to. Lord, that you would bring us back here safely next Sunday to worship you. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.